if there's one thing that's missing in the lives of many Christians, it's doing something. But there's a lot of Christians out there who are living their life as a Christian with nothing to really do with it. What sets our church apart from many others, not all, but many, is that we will give you something to do with your Christianity. People are concerned about appearing as much if they would make such assertions. Uh, to say that you would control your own destiny could border on blasphemy, really, because we all know uh, that God is sovereign and He is in control of all things. And so to say that I can control my fate would almost seem to be posturing myself and putting myself up in the position that is only to be reserved for God. So I guess we could perhaps suggest that we aren't in control of our own destiny, but let me ask you this. Is there anybody in this room that would argue against the idea that a person could single-handedly ruin their own life if they chose to? I mean, I think that's true. Anybody wants to engage in criminal behavior and commit outrageous acts of sin, which is well within the means of anybody here, we could bring about a quality of life for ourselves that's far worse than the one that we currently have. I think I could probably destroy my life within the parameter of about an hour if I did the right things, the wrong things. And if that's true, then would the opposite also be true? If I have it within my own power to ruin my life, do I have it within my own power to somewhat control the outcome in the positive? Not to suggest that we have full reign over what our future looks like, but I believe, and the Bible seems to verify, that we at least have, to some measure, control over the quality of our own future. Not the particulars of our future, but the quality of our future. And I don't mean this to sound like I'm advocating for some sort of delusional, you know, godlike, humanistic approach to life. But perhaps God has given us a certain amount of say as to what our future looks like because He's ordained it to be that way. Maybe God has established that as a principle, and maybe God has agreed to allowing us a certain measure of control over that. I want you to, before we get into Psalm chapter 41, and turn to Galatians chapter 6. It's in your New Testament. In Galatians chapter 6, we read a verse that has become so popular you almost forget that it was a Bible verse. Verse 7 says, Don't be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. This is a biblical principle, that you reap what you sow. He goes further in verse 8 and says, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. This idea of sowing and reaping is the uh, fancy way of talking about the act of planting and harvesting. Whatever seeds you put in the ground are going to determine what kind of a, a, a harvest you get, um, both in the type of seed that you plant and in the quantity of the harvest that you reap. And the Bible here is telling us very clearly that you reap what you sow. So if we're going to take that verse and the biblical principle for which it stands and apply it to our lives, and I guess it's true that we have a great deal of influence over what the quality of our future is going to be. And that, for some people, is more responsibility than they would like to accept. Because having been given the freedom to choose what a person's future looks like means culpability when and if that life comes to ruin. You chose it for yourself. If it's disastrous, beyond repair, it's not God's fault. The biblical principle is true for anybody. If you reap 
or I, rather, if you sow sin and iniquity and transgression and all of those wonderful things, well, you're going to reap then a harvest of destruction and death. And the Bible here is telling us, don't be deceived. Don't think otherwise. Don't believe what anybody would tell you. Don't believe what you yourself might suggest. God's not mocked. God's not mocked. You can't put corn kernels in the ground and hope for peas. What you put in the ground is what you're going to get out of the ground. Some people would rather believe that we're all sort of passive subjects in this life. That our fate's been decided for us. And so we just kind of coast helplessly along and drift along with the current that we're all victims of happenstance. People flow through life under the influences of emotion and sensuality and apathy. Sort of content, actually, with the idea that they have no control. Because then they won't be held responsible for what their life becomes. Some people are going to see themselves as hapless victims of life rather than vice regents of God who have been given the task of subduing the world, having dominion over sin. People like this take very little initiative. They say, well, I am who I am and nothing's going to change that. Which is nice because then no real effort is needed on behalf of those individuals and I guess that's what they're after. An easy life. They don't expect anything to change. They don't really desire anything to change. But the Bible tells us that that's not really the case. We have a great deal of say as to what our lives are going to become. I want to read for you the entire psalm, Psalm chapter 41, and then we'll go through and take a look at it bit by bit. This is a psalm of David, and he says in verse 1, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. Verse 4. I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil of me. When will he die and his name perish? And if he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt. An evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now that he lies down, he won't rise up anymore. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up, that I may repay them. By this I know that you are well pleased with me, because my enemy does not triumph over me. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. And? Amen. Father, as we look at this psalm, I pray that you would help us to glean from it what we can. I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to sort through what can sometimes appear to be a jumbled up mess of words on the page foreign to some of us who attempt to discern what you would have us learn apart from the Holy Spirit. Foreign language to those of us who live our lives in rejection to your Son. Those of us who through unbelief still have a veil over our eyes, as it were, unable to understand the truth of Scripture. But I pray today, as it is taught, that it would be learned. I pray that we could see something in here that has import for each one of us. I pray that by faith we receive what you're trying to teach. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to uh, dissect this psalm just a little bit and actually start and read it out of order. I want to start in verse 5. We already read it straight through, but if you look at verse 5, and David here again is speaking of his enemies. And that's nothing new. Uh, after 40 psalms already, we have seen David constantly dealing with enemies in his life. We know that he was a great man of God. Uh, he was the leader of the nation, and so he has enemies on all fronts uh, by way of foreign adversaries. We also know that he was a military leader and that he had great 
uh, militaristic conquests. And so for that reason, he had great enemies. Uh, but the enemies that he's referring to here in this passage, uh, they're not the enemy nations. These aren't Philistines that he's talking about. They're not the Syrians. They're not the Amalekites. They're not the Ammonites or the Edomites or the Moabites. Those were all enemies of David's, but these aren't the enemies to which he refers. These are actually Jewish Israelis which is significant because the enemies that David is referring to here in this scripture are men of the same religion as David. They are men from the same country as David. Men with the same God. Men on the same mission. Men with the same friends and associates. And yet they're his enemies. Enemies of their own king. Enemies of their own friend. Look at verse 9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I'm trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Why would David, a man after God's own heart, have among God's own people such vowed enemies? Because not all of God's people are God's people. Please, let's not be ignorant. Not everybody who darkens the doors of a church or who claims the name of Christ is actually born again. You give it some time, you'll find out that they are quite opposed to those of faith. There are enemies within the walls of any church. And they're not few and far between, by the way. The further I go, the more I realize that some of the greatest enemies, some of, the, some of those that would hot, most hotly oppose this ministry, are also in the ministry. Fellow pastors and worship leaders, clergy, who want nothing to do with what the Bible says. Just today I hear somebody very high on the ladder of ministerial occupation telling me that there's no such thing as false religion. This is a Bible teacher. This is a leader of men. One who is accountable for the soul, the eternal souls of men and women in this community telling me there's really no such thing as false religion. What you believe, so long as it's sincere, is just fine. P pardon me? What Bible are you reading? Are you reading a Bible at all? I told my wife on the way over here this evening, I'm so convinced of the truth of Scripture that I naively assume that everybody shares the same belief. To me, it's a no-brainer. And I find somebody that's that far off base, it's, it's truly astonishing. It just floors me. You know, because I read in the Bible about false prophets and false teachers and people who are diametrically opposed to all things Christ, and I think, well, it's in the Bible. But then I, I think, well, but are they really out there? I mean, it just seems like everybody kind of agrees, like Jesus, you know, and... And you find them. And the more you talk to them, the more you realize, yeah, that's in them. They don't, they're not on the same page. And these are people not only who go to church, but run church. These are people who would pray with you if you asked. I bet you these enemies of David prayed with him upon occasion. I bet they worshipped with him in the synagogue. I bet they, let's go to the house of the Lord and let's, let's break bread together and, and let's, let's worship and let's study the scriptures and let's talk about the things of God. These enemies are greatly opposed to David. I guess not all of the people of God are people of God. Speaking of his enemies, he says, they speak evil of me. In verse 6 he says, when he comes to me, he speaks lies. <laughs> so really this enemy is, comes to visit him. And apparently, if you haven't caught on, it seems like David is sick. Physically sick. In verse 5, this enemy of his is wondering 
whether or not the sickness that David has is terminal, and if it is, when will he actually die? In verse 8, making reference to an evil disease that clings to him. Now that he lies down, he'll rise up no more. Perhaps he'll die. David's sick. And so whoever this individual is does hospital visits. Makes house calls. How benevolent. How Christian of this enemy. Coming to see David. Perhaps praying with him. Consoling him in his sickness giving him some encouraging words, perhaps verses from Scripture. And David goes, I can see through all that. It's all a lie. Scripture verses. Makes me sick. Coming here and praying for me. Save it. He's my enemy. So they come here and they lie. They pretend to care, but when they go away, they hope for my death. And again, these are close friends of David's. And you got to wonder how they get so close. Probably by lying. <laughs> huh? If anybody comes through the doors here saying, you know what? I hate Jesus. I could give a rip about your religion. In fact, I'm here to discredit and destroy everything that you say. If they were so bold as to do that, um, I don't think that they would ever truly become a friend. Not mine. I just don't have much in common. See, friends go to each other for advice. I'm never coming to you for advice. Friends go to each other for consolation and encouragement. What encouragement do you have to give me? You've got a very hopeless outlook. Friend? No. You'd have to lie to me. You'd have to give the impression that you are a Jesus lover if you want to get in close. See, I'm so staunch on this that I wouldn't even marry a woman who wasn't a follower of Christ, though I had the chance. Five months from the wedding, she wasn't a believer, and I took the ring back. If I won't let a woman like that in very close, then I'm certainly not going to let anybody else in very close. That's not called arrogance. That's called wisdom. You can play as fast and loose as you, with your Christianity as you like. You can let unbelievers in as close as you want. Watch what happens. Do you want to know what will happen? Do you want me to tell you what the Bible says? Do you know what will happen to good character when you hang out with corrupt individuals? You won't save them. They'll destroy you. You're like, that's not nice, Pastor. We should be friends with everybody. Mm -mm. You should choose your friends very, 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 very carefully if you want to make it, if you want God to use you at all, if you want your life to count for something. But again, if you want to play fast and loose with your faith, then go right ahead. How do they get so close to David? Well, by lying. Pretending to be Christian. And I don't get it about some people. Some people are very comfortable with lying. So comfortable with it, so accustomed to it, it's become part of their character, and I don't even know that they know they're doing it anymore. Everything is a lie. Everything is an exaggeration. Nothing is really true. Uh, there's nothing that comes from their mouth that's ever really believable anymore. And by the way, if you have a track record of lying and you've established yourself as a liar, I can't say you'll ever have my trust. You're like, well, I don't want your trust anyway, Pastor. You're a jerk. I, I don't know that you'll ever have anybody's trust. Well, I don't really care. I'm an island. Live and die alone. Yeah, you will. <laughs> have fun. If you want to establish genuine relationships with people, lasting relationships with people, you better learn how to be honest. David doesn't like these folks, these liars, these friend pretenders. And you know that he's speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here? If David, under God's Holy Spirit directive, doesn't appreciate what liars 
come to come. It's safe to say that God doesn't appreciate them much either. You notice there's a bit of a change in verse 7 from verses 5 and 6. In verse 6 it says that if he, referring to his enemy, if he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. All of that is singular. He. Singular. But you get to verse 7 and it says, All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt. An evil disease they say cling to him. Now he's using the pronoun they. Plural. So David's enemies transition in verse 6 from singular to, in verse 7, plural. Rarely does an enemy of Christ and Christ's people, rarely do those enemies have the bravery to attack alone. You know why? Because they know that they're in the wrong. Deep down they know it's wrong to do this, and so they recruit others to join in with them. That was Satan's strategy. Satan rebelled against God, and in, his, in doing so, and convinced a third of the angels to rebel right along with him. Judas, the infamous betrayer of Christ, partnered with the Pharisees in order to accomplish his devious plan. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, they know the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, but they don't only do those things, they also approve of anyone else who joins them. See, David's got enemies, plural, that began with an enemy, singular. But somewhere along the way, that singular enemy wasn't content to attack David by himself, and so he set out to recruit. Join me in my sin. Let's do this together. I'm terribly comfortable rejecting Christ on my own. Won't you join me? And those who join the enemies of God's people become enemies of Christ himself. Don't fool yourself. You can't oppose God's people and love Jesus at the same time. Did you know that? We're one and the same. We are the body of Christ. You have a problem with us. You have a problem with God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A big problem. Notice what they say about David in verse 8. An evil disease clings to him. An evil disease. He's not just sick. There's something evil about the sickness that he has. When they say evil disease, it's actually the word evil in the original text is um, the root word of Belial, Satan. This is an evil disease, a sickness from the devil, <laughs> an accursed illness. They're saying, you know what? David's sick because he's rejected God. All of this has happened to David. You know why? Because he's evil. And this is what happens to evil people. That's what enemies of those that are chosen by Christ often do. They try to cast doubt in the mind of those they attack. Oh, David's accursed of God. He's in league with the devil. Which would probably leave David going, Is it true? Have I done something wrong? Is this happening to me because I've sinned in some area? Well, listen, the enemies of God would always have a Christian believe that. But it's your fault. You know why this is happening? Because you're the sinner. Not me. 
you. See, I love Jesus. I'm a good little boy. But bad things are happening to you, you know why? Because you're not. You're evil. And your sickness proves it. Always trying to cast doubt. That too is satanic. Did you know that? Satan is the great accuser. The Bible says that he stands night and day throwing accusations at the chosen of Christ. Fun for us. And then if Satan's doing it, you know that he's recruiting agents of his own to go and do it also. Because what good is it for Satan to accuse you when Satan is silent? You can't hear him. But he can inspire people around you to throw accusations at you. Well, I don't like so-and-so because they're mean. I don't like so-and-so because what they did was wrong. I don't like so-and-so. And then you start to wonder, well, did I do anything wrong? Am I in sin? Second guessing yourself and doubting yourself? Verse 9 is almost prophetic where it says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus will quote that verse concerning Judas. My friend who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. This would find its fulfillment in the betrayal. Although when Jesus quotes this verse, he doesn't say, in whom I trusted. I don't know that he ever trusted Judas. The Bible says that Jesus could read the hearts of men. He knew what was in their minds. He knew what was in them. On many occasions, he refused to commit himself to certain individuals because though they believed in him, he didn't believe in them. Jesus wasn't naive. Not about Judas, not about anybody. But here, hundreds of years prior, a thousand years before Jesus was even born, David is experiencing something similar. A familiar friend has lifted up his heel against me. It's kind of like what? A, a lifting of the foot like a horse, a vicious kick. Lifting up of the foot. And David says it was a friend who did it. A familiar friend who ate his bread. This, was, this speaks of a relationship that was built on transparency and vulnerability. Communion, fellowship, all of the wonderful things that are a, a Christian friendship is built on. And then this individual, this liar, shows his true colors, turns against David, and becomes his avowed enemy, hoping for his death. And it's these kind of enemies that do their best work in close combat. They need to get in close, and that's why it so troubles David. He was a familiar friend, not just an acquaintance. This was somebody in whom David trusted. And so, as I said before, we see clearly that not only is David being attacked, but also he's sick. He's physically sick. And so there's multiple things going on in David's life that serve to trouble him deeply. His problems are manifold. Spiritual attack, physical sickness. And I'll tell you that pain and trial, trouble in your life, are often the primary means by which God chooses to impart to the Christian those things that the Christian has by prayer been asking God to give him. That's why God allows it. You keep praying to God for patience and endurance and fortitude, faithfulness, trust. And so God goes, okay, the only way I'm going to be able to work this into your character is through pain, trial, trouble. So brace yourself. And oftentimes it's hard for us to see that that's what God is trying to do, but certainly if David is going to be a man of integrity, then God's going to have to put him a little bit through the ringer so that he can learn these things, and he'll do it to us as well. And you need to understand that, that sometimes the multiplication of trouble in your life is exactly what you need to grow and mature. In one, your reliance upon God, and two, your trust in his word. And these trials that David is experiencing work in his life to that very effect. If you look at verse 10, he says this, But you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. And so David is weakened, severely weakened by these attacks. They're persistent, they're consistent. And his physical illness on top of it, adding insult to injury. 
He's very weakened both spiritually and physically, and now in that condition, he looks to God for the help that he needs. God promises to be strong on behalf of those who are weak. You remember what he says to Paul in 2 Corinthians. He says, My strength is seen perfectly when you're weak. And so many of us, we work as hard as we can to remain strong, to not need God. We buy good insurance policies. We clamor for the highest pay and the best benefits and the most profitable retirement packages and we seek the best health care and we... Uh, none of those things are wrong, but you see, you see what we have a tendency to do is to so take care of ourselves that we have no need for God's care. We become so strong in ourselves and so independent in ourselves and so confident in ourselves that we're never dependent on God. We're never confident in Him. And I'm not so saying that you should go out there and be so irresponsible as to cancel all your insurance and quit your job and just, you know, I'm going to live under a bridge and God's going to take care of me. Because He probably won't. But there is a balance there. And the last thing I want to do is become so comfortable in this life that I have no need for the Lord. And yet, isn't that the American way? Have it the best you can so that God won't be troubled by giving you his best. In verse 11, David says, By this I know that you are well pleased with me, because my enemy doesn't triumph over me. That's how David knows that God is pleased with him. His enemies won't win. So David here is looking for vindication. Okay, he's, he's losing right now. It's like, advantage, enemy. And David's going, but you know what? You've never, you've never left me in the hands of my enemies. And that's how I know I'm right with you, Lord. And you notice that David isn't being presumptive here. He's rather unsure of himself. If you look at verse 4, he's like, Lord, be merciful to me. I have sinned against you. There's nothing specific that he's asking for forgiveness for. He just knows that he's sinful and that he's sinned. And this kind of blanket statement there, Lord, forgive me. I'm not sure what for, but there's, God, there's, always, there's always something. You feel like that, don't you? It's like, I don't even know what I've done. I just know I just, I'm no good. David knows he's sinned somewhere. And so he's looking to the Lord for deliverance, for vindication. There's no presumption in him. But some people, some people are just the opposite. They're all presumption. <laughs> when things go bad for them, they never consider the possibility that it actually could be because they have sinned somewhere. Maybe things are going bad because you've been unfaithful. Just maybe. Some people, they'd never entertain that thought. Oh, no, I'm a victim of something, you know. Oh, Satan's after me. Oh, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm God's righteous little child. I'd never do anything wrong. And it's like, no, yeah, you might. You might have, yeah, it could be because you just, you were a buffoon. You're like, was that beyond your wildest imaginations that you'd ever make a mistake? It's not beyond David's imagination. He knows very well that he's made all kinds of mistakes and doesn't deserve God's mercy. That's why he's asking for it. And that's why he's asking for mercy in particular. Because he knows that he's undeserving. He says, As for me, you uphold me in my integrity, and you set me before your face forever. So David knows that he's in God's good favor. He has confidence in the Lord. Even if he doesn't have confidence in himself, he has confidence in God. And so in this time of great turmoil in his life, he has been consistently attacked on the spiritual level. His friends have become his enemies, which would make anybody wonder if they're doing it right. When you
your friends turn against you, you got to be going, have I done something wrong? He's been stricken with some sort of, uh, perhaps, borderline terminal illness. Almost seems like God's turned against him. And yet David remains confident that he is in good God's good favor. He says, you uphold me in my integrity and you set me before your face forever. Like he's in good standing and he's confident of that. How can David, when things are falling apart in his life, remain confident that it isn't his fault? Because if we can find out how David can retain such confidence in times like this, then perhaps you and I could do what he did in order to have that kind of confidence when things are falling apart. See, because I don't know about you, but when things go wrong in my life, I automatically question if it's my fault. I think it's natural. I also think to a certain extent it's healthy. But in those times, I would also like to have the ability to think things through, like David does here, and come to the conclusion that it's not my fault, this is all part of the game. That though things are falling apart in my life right now, it isn't because of any personal failure on my behalf. There's another reason for it. That will help me endure through perhaps anything. And so how can David, when things are falling apart, be reassured that it isn't his fault? Now we go back to the first three verses. David says this, Blessed is he who considers the poor. Why? Well, because the Lord will deliver him in times of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and he'll be blessed on the earth. God won't deliver him to the will of his enemies. These are promises that David has understood. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. He will sustain him on his sickbed. And so how can David be reassured that this isn't, all of this trouble isn't because of him? One, he knows how God has ordained things to work. David's clear on how God works. He says it here. If a person considers the poor, then God promises to, not deli to deliver him in times of trouble. He won't turn him over to his enemies. That's how God works. David understands God. Listen, the more you understand how God works, the more you can understand how God is working even when things in your life don't seem to be so wonderful. This is precisely what helps David endure. He knows how God has ordained things to work. The things he declares in the first three verses are definitive statements. These are promises of God that David isn't just making up to try and console himself in a difficult time. David says the Lord will preserve that man, that Lord, the Lord will bless that man on the earth, the Lord won't deliver that man to the will of his enemies, the Lord will strengthen him. So, like All of these things, these principles, these concepts are found in Scripture. Isaiah 58.10 says, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. This is a definitive statement. It's a promise of God. If you pour yourself out for the needs of others, then when you yourself are needy, God won't neglect you. Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Proverbs 11.25 says that the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. You get that this is a concept that runs throughout Scripture. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. If we invest in the lives of others, we, in a roundabout way, are investing in our own good. And David knows that he's been doing that. He's been living according to how God has ordained things to work. He's been giving help to those in need, and so he knows that God won't neglect him in his time of need. And so there's David on his sickbed being attacked by his enemies, and he spends time reflecting on past obedience and the promises that accompany those obediences, and he knows that God is going to keep his promise to them. How can we be sure 
when things fall apart, that it's not because of us, that it isn't our fault. Well, go back in your memory and take account of what you've been doing. Have you been obeying God? Have you been living a righteous life? Or have you been compromising? Are you harboring secret sin? Are you doing things that you know you shouldn't? Is there transgressive activity in your life? Well, then it's your fault. If those things are absent, but rather you've been obeying God, you've been honoring Him, you've been worshiping Him, you've been doing all that He's told you to do, refraining from those things He's told you to stay away from, well then, praise God. He'll keep His promises to you. He'll deliver you from your trouble. He'll sustain you. He'll give you the endurance you need. You will be found faithful. He won't let you go. David gets it. And at some of the worst points and at some of the lowest times of his life, he has the confidence of knowing that God is still there. And sometimes God is all you've got. If you've ever heard the name Corey Ten Boom, she's famous for have saying that you never know that Jesus is all you need until he's all you have. And if there was ever a woman that didn't have anything but Christ alone, it was her. Gotta be glad to bring you to a point in your life where he's all you've got. So that you could taste and see how wonderful it is to have Jesus and nothing more. I've heard stories of missionaries who went to other countries and suffered greatly for the cause of Christ and they were tortured and held hostage and suffered all kinds of injury and torment and anguish and then they come back to America and they're safe and fat and happy. And part of them misses the torture. Part of them wishes they could go back into it. You know why? Because Jesus is so faint and the relationship we have with him is so foggy when we've got everything we want and more. It's a trade-off, I suppose. there's a way to do Christianity that's dry and boring and stale and the world is all too familiar with that one and then there's a way to do it that's exciting and vibrant and, and tear-jerking and challenging and it makes you want to cry it makes you want to scream it makes you want to laugh it makes you want to weep and that's the one that we want to offer God will take you crazy places and if you want to go he'll, he'll make sure you get there